The Vril Codex Chapter 6 Doppelganger Bob Wilkinson sat, his eyes glazed. With devoted, meticulous air, he surveyed the items laid out in front of him. He stood at the Bundespolizei Brandenburg Police Headquarters in Potsdam. Various items lay in front of him, a wedding ring, an ornate cigarette lighter, a bracelet and a chain. The chain included a small photo of Bob and Jane inside. Keys and a watch were next to it. All were laid out, still discoloured by the fire. Are these your wife's possessions, sir? asked Police Inspector Schnitkel. Nearby, Sally Baldwin indicated that these were Jane's belongings. She placed an official form in front of Bob. Can you please sign? Sign along the bottom of the form. Bob signed, looking pale and haggard. Still in shock, he gathered Jane's few things into a plastic bag. His face was full of disbelief. His speech may be affected by the tranquilizers that were managing to keep him calm. Then Schnickel inquired, You have seen the body and identified it as Jane Wilkinson? I couldn't. She's too badly burned and unrecognisable. But these are my wife's belongings. So it must be her. There will be no need for further distress to you or Mrs Baldwin. Here are the authorization papers in relation to transporting your wife's body to England for burial. Please accept my condolences. I'm very sorry for your loss. Bob stood up, sweeping his hair back in an attempt at composure, clasping the plastic bag tightly. I just want to know what happened. Jane was a was a good, careful driver. She was familiar with dangerous situations. She dealt with them almost casually. Yet she comes to Germany and... His face frowned with anger, unable to finish his sentence. Your wife, she was driving recklessly and lost control of the vehicle because she was driving too fast, Stinkel added. Quite wild how she came to be where she was and the speeding is unknown to us. We are making all the correct forensic efforts to ascertain why and how the incident happened at all. Bob looked up. Why was she out so late? What could she have been doing? Perhaps... As it was a nice night, she was photographing the Brandenburg parks under the moonlight. But I'm afraid we will never know what your wife was doing and why your wife was out at that time of night, replied Schninkel. Bob looked a frozen and broken man, nodding with resignation. Later that day, Bob and Sally visited the charming house where Jane had been staying. I'll drop Jane's keys in with Gustav Werner at his office later, Baldwin said. He would have been here, but thought strangers are the last thing you would want at this time, Bob. Sally looked at Bob with concern. So far he had done well, but signs were that there was a nervous breakdown on its way. First it had been short-term memory loss, possibly as a result of all the cannabis he'd been doing, but now it seemed impossible to gain Bob's concentration at all. Even quitting that had still made no difference. He seemed in a dream, like the living dead, a zombie. Sally thought. He and Jane were joined at the hip. How would he get through? I really think you should go home, she said. Let me do everything out here and tidy up uh, all the unpleasant affairs. You don't need this. Bob stood up, looking devastated. Jane's laptop camera and notebooks were in his hands, along with a battered backpack. Thank you, Sally, but you don't know how grateful I am for your support. I felt closer to to Jane this way. I, I feel I feel closer to Jane this way. I, I I had to come and collect her things and take her back with me. Sally didn't look happy at Bob's demeanour. I want to make sure everything's packed, you know, packed upstairs for going home. Jane, as she just as she would have wanted it, you know, as she'd have packed it all, everything as she would have wanted. Said Bob, almost delirious. Sally looked thoughtfully at him with concern that was becoming grave. Can't this all wait? she asked. Nah, this is something I have to do now. I know I must be here. Do you believe in fate, Sally? I didn't used to, but this clairvoyant I used to go to in Beverly Hills, she used to ma- she made me believe in it fervently. Why? Bob circled round into the hallway and stepped back into the room, though inside he got sick of the way everything she ever said just seemed like a cliché. Look, this is real. I foresaw this happening, all of it. Do you hear? I knew it was going to happen. The very night Jane died, I I saw it all happen. 
Sally couldn't help feeling these were delusional thoughts of someone on the edge, but understandably so. Bob, you know that cannot be. Believe what you want, Sally. I'll prove it to you somehow. I felt Jane's passing. I woke up knowing. Didn't Jane tell you of our mutual telepathy? We didn't just know what each other would, would email or call, but other things, even our states of happiness, sadness and situation. We'd have the same dreams. I, I, I knew her thoughts and feelings, uh, and she'd know mine as well. You're very close, Bob, replied Sally. Yeah, Jane and I got quite close too, yeah. But you had a, you had a special connection. Jane and I got quite close too, but you had a special connection. I've never seen a relationship so good. You were made for each other. She knew that. Sally sat brooding on Bob's words whilst he continued the somber duties. He felt like he was picking over him part of himself. Books, cigarettes, he didn't smoke. The red wine, the camera, everything seemed part of him. It all seemed part of him, except one vital ingredient. Jane herself. Diana Baker entered the room, clutching papers in her hand. Sally had let her in whilst Bob was lost in his thoughts. Looking shocked, Bob turned round to her. Who are you? I'm Diana Baker. You don't know me, but I met your wife, Jane. I have this for you. In her hand were some printed photographs. Those done at the bookshop. I'm sorry about what's happened. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I don't wish to offend or invade your privacy. That's kind of you to think of me. Well, us, really. I met Jane not long after she got here. We really clicked. In fact, we were going to have dinner. I was looking forward to it, but she, she didn't show. I was going to help Jane around Berlin. Well... Germany, really. I've lived here a while and I wanted to help. She was such a vivacious, adorable person, I thought. Christ, it's just so unfair. She looked annoyed, yet sympathetic and crestfallen. Baker edged forward, almost embracing Bob, but held herself back. And Bob looked relieved. Don't worry, it means a lot to meet someone who was close to Jane at the end. I guess you're one of the last people Jane thought she could trust, even. This is for you. I think it's something Jane wanted from her old friend at the bookshop. She handed him an envelope. That's how we met, you see. Oh, Ada Brown. Of course. Thanks. Here's some money, replied Bob. No, that's that won't be necessary. Have it. She walked away and looked back in a haunted, wistful manner. Dinah's mouth arched downward with melancholy. Goodbye, Bob. It was nice to meet you. Thanks again. Bob put the photos in one of many carry cases and busied himself with zipping up the cases in a haze of endless double-checking. His mind was lost as if this were not really happening. He felt he needed a drink. Wilkinson collected the various cases and walked downstairs, checking the hallway once more. He didn't want to leave the last place his wife slept, yet part of him didn't want to leave. The fear was leaving Jane behind forever, which he knew he had to, at least in this life. Come on, Sally. That's everything. Let's get out of here, Bob said with a final decisive tone. Is that everything? She replied. Yeah, I'm done, he said with a resigned air of a man finished. Sally thought she perceived something deeper in those words. How would he live without her? They both headed for the waiting taxi. Funerals are always strange affairs. Some say they are paths to a higher understanding. Many say they are a spiritual enlightened experience or epiphany. It helps us to accept that once we are gone, we will be reunited with our loved ones. Some would say they are the opposite, a ghastly charade of meaningless cliches and religious dogma, leading to the finality and loss of all hope of ever seeing that person again. Some feel like it's losing an emotionally severed limb, never to be healed. They feel surrounded by uncomfortable, half-known relatives with patronising one-liners, alone, abandoned, and never to return. Bob, with the help of a therapist, slowly found the strength to cope with the emotional emptiness inside, to help heal the chasm left behind. Mutual friends offered lots of help, but Bob preferred to cope largely alone. He was a solitary man, a few friends. Mutual friends offered lots of help, but Bob preferred to cope largely alone. He reluctantly accepted help from Jane's friends, but they would bring a level of emotional debt he would rather avoid. Each day he had a fixed day-by-day running programme of activities to get through life and survive. Trying to keep occupied, the healing might begin. But just when he felt progress, the tears began. Inner deep pain would return along with panic attacks. 
Bob felt some solace in focusing on journalism and some of the photographic ideas he had been working on with Jane. He mostly photographed cricket matches to begin with. The gentle ebb and flow of the sport was a kind of therapy in itself. The humour of the many eccentrics to be found at Lord's Cricket Ground helped in particular. They were part of a bygone age. The TV presenting was too much to consider now. He didn't feel presentable. His hair had grown and he had uncharacteristic stubble developing. In between work, Bob had been photographing his and Jane's favourite places. Little Venice in Maida Vale was a favourite evening haunt. The Royal Albert Hall was a familiar visiting spot for the Proms concerts each year. Such happy memories. Today, a simple photo of Barnes Common would be good. Carrying an accompanying tripod, he barely understood the complicated methods of this particularly powerful digital camera. Somehow he would come out with great shots. It was so easy to use. He quickly began work, and Bob could have sworn as he had taken the last shot that he could see Jane, or someone just like her, on the nearby empty park bench. Suddenly above the wind came a high-pitched noise, almost like a cat's meow in a high, recognisable pitch. No language came from the voice, but it was a kind of wail. He heard it with his own ears, yet somehow it was in his head. It was Jane's spirit voice. Jane sat gazing at Bob with big, staring, longing eyes. A noise like an Aeolian harp filled Bob's head. He banged his own forehead till it hurt. But she was still there, bobbing her head to one side and smiling that coy smile. It is her. It's Jane, he thought to himself. The movements and expressions were identical. Suddenly, two joggers and a cyclist obstructed his view as Bob prepared to walk over to Jane, or the woman who was her doppelganger. But as soon as they were gone, she was no longer there. A dog off its lead sniffed around a waste bin by the seat, but Jane was gone, nowhere to be seen. And he could not move. He cut an odd figure, stood with his camera, his face wan and ashen. Are you all right, young man? You look rather pale said an elderly female voice. It was Mrs Taylor, one of his neighbours. At 80 years old, she was an active member in the local neighbourhood watch. Hello, Mrs Taylor. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. He was breathing heavily, a sign of shock. He needed to take stock of himself. As the days passed, he consumed himself with his hobby. To fight the insomnia, he would walk miles with various cameras in a backpack, and he visited everywhere he and his wife loved, like a wistful, nostalgic, lost soul. His work was surprisingly good for a novice, having been influenced by Jane's keen eye for detail. It was as if Jane was with him anyway, and regularly Jane would appear by his side, fleetingly smiling at a bus stop or on a passing tube train, always staring longingly. Bob's therapist explained to him that bereavement is a long process. We often see our loved one. It is normal, and it will pass, the quack said. So Bob resigned himself to it being in his mind. Yet still she would appear as if she were with him on his travels, like a watching angel, and his heart bled. But as the days wore on, he grew hardened, knowing that Jane was dead and that he must move on, for one day they would be reunited. Bob went to watch a cricket match at a local ground and did some simple shopping for groceries on the way home. To feel complete, Bob regularly attended cricket matches to relax. He stopped at the supermarket, the corner shop and then the off-licence for a bottle of wine. It was important to enjoy the simple things in life and not to want more, he thought. On this trip home, he decided to research the postcards in his local shop window, perhaps to look for a potential lodger advert. In the window, he could see her again. He closed his eyes. He opened them wide and he looked, and he still saw the beautiful blonde he once knew across the road, directly opposite him. It was her. The clothes were correct. There was no way this wasn't Jane. He span round, knocking the shopping from the passing pedestrian's hand. Bob apologised and, on focusing across the road, realised she had disappeared. This was torture. There's no way this was a ghost. She was far too real and, and physical, he thought. Bob knew this would sound mad to anyone, but Jane was still alive. Later on that day, Sally Baldwin visited Bob, and he gave her a progress report on how he felt and how prospects were going, but then told her his beliefs. Look, you know this can't be happening, it's impossible, Sally had replied, with the air of someone accustomed with being a patient counsellor. I've seen Jane many times. She keeps following me. She's trying to contact me. I know she is, and if you don't believe me, I will see a psychic. I know this sounds crazy, but you must believe me. 
There's a spiritualist church near Hyde Park Corner, I think it is. The author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, founded it. I'm going to Google it now. They'll help me if you won't, Bob. Nobody is denying Jane was special, but there are many beautiful platinum blondes in London. Who knows? Perhaps words got out. You're a bachelor now and you're being stalked. I don't know. She stumbled on her words in a half-joking manner. Very funny. This is no joke. It's very real. Could Jane still be alive? Perhaps the police have it all wrong and she wasn't killed in Berlin at all. Sally pointed at the drinks cabinet. Look, sweetheart, just relax, okay? You know this can't be true. We saw her burnt possessions without a DNA test. We couldn't know anymore. Jane is gone, Bob. You must move on. Bob frowned. Without a DNA test, we couldn't know any more. I have moved on, as you put it, Sally, but Jane doesn't want me to. Maybe we never saw her body after all. That body was unrecognisable. Sally looked sympathetically at Bob. This is what your heart wants, but she's still alive somehow, but you know it doesn't make sense. Your mind must tell you so, surely. She's trying to tell me something. I know, I know it could be me, but it's not, I'll tell you. Bob, you can wish all you want, and I'm sorry to tell you this, but Jane is gone. Why don't you go away for a few days? Maybe a trip down to your beloved Quantox or Exmoor to take it easy. Bob agreed that he might. Letting Sally out, he thanked her and watched her through the windows to her car. The next day, as he had promised himself, Bob visited the medium at the Psychic Association near Hyde Park. A plump little woman called Doreen Brown sat opposite Bob as he searched for answers. In her seventies, but still sprightly for her age, she wore an old-fashioned rose-coloured blouse. She had been sitting with Bob for some time. She accurately and sometimes inaccurately reflected on Bob's life. Her eyes became glazed and distanced as she whispered, Bob, I, I see a sea dragon. But you must beware. It's a, it's a dangerous figure which I see, one that can destroy. Beware the chameleon, she said, rocking back and forth. Her Romany jewellery glinted in the lamplight on the table beside her. Suddenly a cat entered the room. She's more familiar, said the old lady. They let me have her here to help me. Suddenly the black cat arched its back and made a strange high-pitched noise and Bob felt himself wanting to laugh. It all seemed like a staged melodrama. He changed his view as Doreen began to speak. My, uh, my familiar brings Jane to me. The Jane went up on its two back legs and let out a high-pitched noise like a shriek. It was disturbing to Bob and sounded like a voice. Bob had never heard a cat make any noise like this. It's possessed as a familiar by Jane's spirit. It is giving a warning and I see a vision of Jane's spirit and she's very worried and uh, and she says she says she loves you but there's nothing else. Uh, and she's she's fading. Yeah, she She's gone. Oh. Suddenly the vision was gone, she said. They sat in silence for a while and Doreen explained not to be frightened by the warning that was given and that it might be a good sign. She could do little to change Bob's anxiety. He left thanking the old lady and taking any relief he could from the experience. But far from being reassured, he felt as if he had been given a stark warning. Bob was drained. He was tired of the inner doubt and turmoil. An early night was the only answer. Turning round to go to bed, Bob froze, his mouth gazing open with surprise and fear. Standing in front of him was Jane Wilkinson, looking beautiful, worried and concerned. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 Mind Game Mrs Baldwin, Bob's problems are based in not being able to let go or to accept the tragedy of what's happened to him. They were deeply in love. He and Jane, simple as that. Dr Gordon Green assured Sally. Together, Green and Baldwin sat in the psychiatrist's simple cream-coloured office. It was quite formal, but reassuring to Sally. Green sat explaining Bob's condition. Bob is a sensitive young man. Jane was the focus not just of his love, but his life. He lived through her. She helped inspire his way forward in his world as if her achievements were central to his well-being. If she was happy on one side, he himself could move forward on the other. Without her, he lost part of himself. Bob won't accept she's dead. 
So, like a child, he invented in a fantasy an imaginary friend. But to Bob, she, this fantasy was real. Green continued. You know, I remember many years reading about a psychic phenomena. It was a book written by the late great Arthur C. Clarke. He explained how the mind is capable of creating or believing almost anything to fulfil a need. Just like a mirage in a desert. It's all in the mind. And this fascinated me, you know. It's why I entered the psychiatric world. Ghosts don't exist. They're mind projections, a kind of hallucination. And Sally was less convinced by his self-reverential congratulatory tone. I'm glad you're soothed by my words, by my Mrs Baldwin. But remember my own and the late Mr Clark's explanation is one of many when it comes to ghosts. I mean, I believe this theory personally, certainly more than the idea that ghosts themselves are some sort of video imprint on time. I mean, some, some think they, they are, like a real-life recording, playing itself again and again and again in certain circumstances, as if certain circumstances produce a previous ancient experience. I mean, I remember one client of mine swearing he saw a Roman legion in Bath once. All complete fantasy, of course. I find all the explanations rather far-fetched, just as much as the other ideas, replied Sally. She now felt even more uneasy with this lecture. Dr. Green, Bob was seeing her everywhere, in his home, the street, everywhere. Surely your theories, well, do you think Bob is crazy? No, not at all. Quite the contrary, replied Green. He has come to terms with my theories, not of how ghosts are imprinted on time, but my belief that there is a rational, scientific explanation to everything he was experiencing. The complexities of his mind produced the visions. Green became visibly excited by his own words. You know, Sally, we, we use a very small fraction of our brains. Have you ever wondered what we are truly capable of? Well, you can see the capacity of the brain is endless, and Bob has come to terms with my answer to his problems. He knows that his mind created a fantasy to help him survive emotionally and mentally. Bob's real reason for his nervous breakdown was that his rational mind knew what was happening all along. The right side of his brain fantasised beyond reason, and the left side knew the truth. So confusion arose. Is Bob feeling more secure? Is he ready for the outside world? As ready as he'll ever be. It is time, I believe, replied Green. Over the next few months, we'll monitor his progress. And now he comes to terms with Jane's loss. What worries me was Bob's and even your belief in a shared telepathy between the two of them. I've seen proof, believe me, said Sally. Green answered haughtily. We believe what we want of friends, unwittingly complying with armless auto-suggestion and fantasy. You know, like that bloke, Darren Brown. Sally felt beaten. Green had an answer for everything. As long as Bob was going to be okay, she thought. Who knows? added Green, slightly patronisingly. Many of my fellow colleagues believe that ESP does exist, and that proof is around the corner. We all know that the symbol laboratory tests I may, I, may, I may be proved wrong, but we all know about the symbol laboratory tests. Bob needs his work, I think. It's a, it's a shame he cannot focus on any children. But still, still, that was yet to come. So tragic. Yeah. Yeah, replied Sally uneasily. I will make sure that Bob's focus is work. And I will be there as often as I can. I might even move in with him temporarily, she said in an over-the-top Californian manner. A buzzer sounded by the doctor. A voice announced. we got Bob Wilkinson on the line. Is it uh, convenient to bring him in? Uh, yes, G go ahead. Go ahead, said Green, looking reassuringly at Sally. Bob was letting the room, looking refreshed. His colour had returned. He looked different, losing the former haunted look. Hello, Sally, Dr Green. I'm packed and ready to leave. Everything's going to be fine now. Thank you so much for everything, Dr Green. Sally hugged Bob. His eyes seemed glazed. 
The smile seemed false, but Green seemed happily convinced of his own good work, and parked outside. Didn't want you to waste a fortune on a taxi, she said. It's only a few miles from it, the barn, Sally, but thank you so much. I've been looking forward to leaving. Excellent to hear, replied Green. The Priory Clinic in Roehampton was the best in the country. It was not far from Barnes, and was reserved for celebrities and film stars. Only the best for Bob Sally had felt. She saw him as an investment. To help him recover would be a wise investment, she thought, spiritually and professionally. In a rather secluded spot, the large white building had been Bob's home for many weeks. His delusions were far from drug-induced, thought Sally, as the clinic concentrated on drug addiction but they would surely know how to cure Bob. Sally helped pick up the cases with a nearby male nurse. Let's go, Bob. Yeah. He turned to Green. Thank you again for everything. His face was rather pathetic and over-apologetic. They both moved to the door and the nearby somewhat grand large front hall that was carpeted and beautifully decorated. A nearby receptionist smiled with recognition as they both departed to Sally's car parked near the entrance of the gravel drive. I knew you would like this fabulous house. Looks can be deceptive, replied a pensive Bob. The drive back to Barnes was soured by an argument. Sally insisting on moving in temporarily, but Bob insisting she go back home to her husband and leave him alone. As a relief, Bob took his coat off in the front room. Sally tried to persuade him not to be alone. How about a pint in one of those lovely local pubs or a dinner with me and Mike? she asked. Nah, you just, you must get back home to him. He's probably feeling neglected, said Bob. I'm fine by my own tonight, honestly. Maybe tomorrow night I will. I'll just need solitude tonight. For Bob, it was just as his favourite poet, Cole, just said, there were only fears in solitude. Well, as long as you promise, I'll tell Mike when I get back and we will spy you rotten. Sure, I, I won't let you down, replied Bob, smiling. Bob wandered to and fro, looking at the familiar photos, ornaments, paintings, almost looking with tenderness, the memories filling with his mind with fondness. I made sure this place has been kept clean. I got my cleaner to come over. It's just as you left it. It's a lot tidier than when I left it, for sure. I need to get some food in. Sally folded her arms. What's your plans for the next few days, then? Well, to finish the photographic job for that cricket website... Need to do photos and profiles of the players. I'd nearly finished it before, you see. Sally then thought to herself and decided to suggest what Green had said earlier. You'll need to work after that, won't you? We need to keep you busy. I've been talking to my contacts about the TV work and sports journalism. I may have some good news for you tomorrow night, Sally replied with enthusiasm. Bob's hangdog expression was hardly inspiring. Join my agency, you know what Jane wanted. I'll go over it all with you tomorrow. I guess I should keep busy, Bob answered. You know what, Bob? You're too nice. You didn't push your photography and writing talents before you didn't want to compete with Jane. You really are talented as Jane. She used to tell me all the time, now Jane's not around, things are different for you. The situation is different. In my next board meeting, you're going to be the topic of discussion, okay? Bob thought about it, feeling disloyal. OK then, if you think it's right. Thank you, Sally. Sally beamed. Fantastic. You're going to be part of the board tomorrow and it's a celebratory dinner like no other. Bob looked sceptical. What if your colleagues don't agree? I'd rather hold off my celebration until you all agree. What if one of them doesn't like my work? Sally suddenly looked nervous. Look, it'll be fine. Don't worry. Bob walked to the door and told her hurriedly, Me and Jane, we were going to sell up, you know. We wanted to head to the West Country, Quantox or Exmoor. We loved Bath and Glastonbury. All the mysticism fascinated Jane. We used to visit where the poet Coleridge did his walking tours. We visited Cheddar and that little village where he wrote The Ancient Mariner. I feel doomed like that character at the moment. In what way? Sally asked. Bob stared at the portrait of himself and Jane, smiling together on the wall. He didn't reply. I didn't know you were planning to move, said Sally. We decided before she left for Berlin. His face became serious. Jane tried to tell me something, I'm, I'm sure. Whether I'm insane or not, I believe it to be so, but I will never know what. Sally tried to ignore Bob's words. So, will you still move? Nah, not without Jane, he replied. 
Sally was now worrying. Perhaps Green's worst fears were true. Bob might never recover. Bob, now Bob, we must leave those thoughts behind. Bob's haunted face changed. It's okay. Say hi to Mike for me. See you tomorrow. I've kept you. Sorry. Bob could sense Sally had forgotten an appointment. Hey, I gotta get going. I forgot I got a meeting in summer with a guy from Playboy magazine. He's one of those editors, you know. My work is very, very... I better call him. I'm late. Sally nervously grabbed her bag and mobile, leaving in a muddled panic. Looking scatty and eccentric, she mouthed, See you tomorrow, as her client answered her phone call. Darling, how are you? She projected into the phone in her high-end, upper-class American tone. Sally hurriedly explained what happened to her contact. Remember, Bob? Well, he's just fine. Back to normal. Back where he belongs. Look, I'll see you in 20 minutes. Bob's first night of freedom from the endless therapy was at first wonderful, but soon the insomnia crept in. Maybe the tranquilizers were the solution, he thought, as he looked at the bedside table. Nah, he thought. As he almost placed one blue Librium tablet in his mouth, instead he mouthed the breathing exercises to himself. Four seconds in, eight out. Breathe in love and light, breathe in out the darkness, the pain, the tension. He repeated the words of his analyst in his mind, but he felt no improvement after a few minutes of this. Bob thought to himself how dependent he'd become in the institution. Everybody did everything for you. There were no strains. He felt truly institutionalised. It felt as if he were in a protective womb. Always he was in a haze of various tranquilizings or sleeping pills. In a way, after the initial thrill, he missed the safety of that. Now he was trapped with his own mind. He was playing tricks, as the doctors had said. But however well-intentioned the doctors seemed, they had bills to pay, and he was their business. The Alcoholics Anonymous self-help groups had taught him long ago that it is better to face life as a sober person. Be the person you really are instead of switching one addiction for another. A beer seemed preferable to Bob than a lifetime of medication and substance dependency. He put his slippers on and edged downstairs. He poured a small glass of port and stared into the distance into the front room. He thought how in reality insomnia was simply a fulfilment of an inner fear of the emptiness of the lonely dark hours stretching forward. The hours were never ending never reaching the heaven of sleep. Bob looked at the portrait on the wall again of himself and Jane. Unknown to the hospital warders for the next few weeks, he had been flushing the medications down the toilet. Why must I agree with what they want me to believe? Bob had thought to himself for weeks. He reasoned in his own mind that the reason he had a breakdown was not because he had imagined Jane, but because he had doubted it in his own mind. In reality, she really was trying to contact him. The doctors had rational 21st century minds that couldn't have the capacity to understand. Why couldn't they see that? Bob sipped the soothing port. You will come back to me, he whispered. Bob knew the truth, only beginning to improve once he knew this. He had simply humoured the hospital staff with their patronising counselling and chemical treatments for everything. Suddenly, as Bob's mind drifted, the living room door slammed shut. Looking round, startled, even the curtains seemed to move, shuffling on their own. On inspection, the windows were closed. He opened the front door. To his relief, he hadn't left it open. But where did the breeze come from? He could have sworn for a second someone was in the room, looking over his shoulder at every turn. There was no fear in Bob, only hope. He looked in the hall once again, but there was nothing. Bob had another sip and looked at the belongings in the front room again. He stared at the photography books and the old architectural books they had collected. Wilkinson continued looking at various accounts of global conflicts Jane had written, and lastly the photos of her beautiful face. Bob looked down at Jane's handbag, opening it tenderly. He surveyed the contents. He gently held her mascara, lipstick and mirror. His large hands held each precious item. Stirring, happy, reverie, and inevitable nostalgia and sentimental feelings. His heart ached as so he knew he must stop. These were items so close to Jane. Everyday items that symbolised the closeness of their lives intertwined. Looking in one of Jane's old battered camera bags, he checked the condition of the camera inside. Once he was happy that all was well, he then noticed a folder with the words Photos for Jane on the outside. Of course, he thought. These were the papers or photographs that had been given to him at the ass in Berlin by Diana Baker. Bob unstuck the seal protecting the contents and opened the folder. He felt thrilled. Any connection like this with Jane was wonderful, but melancholy too. As his enthusiasm gripped him, he looked through the photos. He expected to see landscapes, architectural wonders of Germany, buildings magnificent and captured beautifully on film. 
Instead, he saw a series of close-ups of individuals. Bob didn't know who these men were. Each photo was full of a dark-suited man. Often they wore dark glasses and black gloves. The facial shots and puzzling profile photos of each man showed great detail. Who and where these photos were taken seemed a mystery. Bob closed the folder, looking at the unmoving door and curtains, and wondered what the intriguing mystery lay in the photographs. End of chapter 6 and 7